thank you. Um, well, firstly, I want to congratulate the organisers of this meeting. I think they've got together a terrific set of lectures. Well done. Um, I think it's great. So, so my, what I'm going to talk about is cosmology. And the first part I'm going to talk about is standard cosmology. What is absolutely standard then? I will give some critical comments on standard cosmology. And if I have time, I will look at some issues that come from looking at it in a slightly broader context. Now, there's three separate review articles. I write a lot of review articles, which I might refer you to. Classical and quantum gravity, this is a millennium review article of mine called um, 83 Years of General Relativity and Cosmology, Progress and Problems. And this is a review, classical and quantum gravity, on the state of cosmology. It'll be very similar to what I do, but it gives you a, um, a coherent view of that, which you can look up if you wish. Now, for the alternative cosmologies, um, I did a set of Cargier's lectures, which then got written up with Henk van Elst, and they're available on the web, so you can get them on the archive. I take it you all know how to get the archive. If you don't, you must ask um, some of the um, support people for this meeting. And this is a review of alternatives, of alternative models to the standard model. To start off... Uh, and, and I will try say something about that during the course of this talk. Now, finally, at the, there was a general relativity meeting in Durban about um, two years ago now in which I did a critical survey of cosmology called The Status of Cosmology 2001, Two Views and a Middle Way. Now, I will be giving you um, that particularly in the, um, the, the, the late afternoon session when I will give the... Uh, uh, a talk about it. But so what I want to say to start off with, just this is called, as I said, two views in a middle way. Cosmology today, there are very conflicting views. There's a group of people running around saying cosmology is solved. All we need to do is fill in a little de few details and then we're done. Uh, there's a different view which I will make um, a case for um, in that afternoon lecture whenever it is. It's... Um, uh, um, yeah, on Thursday afternoon, there's a different view, which is that cosmology is pretty much a disaster because we don't actually understand any of its major dynamical <laughs> features. And then the middle view is somewhere in between those, that it's a big mistake to believe that cosmology is solved. To say it's a total disaster, there are actually quite a good reasons for saying that, but that's also too far the other side and that the real situation is somewhere in the middle. So this is just a brief sort of overview. So what I'm going to start off with is a summary of the standard model because um, that's what I've been asked to do. And um, the standard model, of it's known under various names, Friedman, F, Lemaitre, L, Robertson, or Walker, and these different names are used about it. Friedman is the Russian who first um, produced one of these models in 1922 and another one in 1924. Lemaitre, 1927, was the first person who made these models kind of um, physically relevant. Friedman approached it mathematically, whereas Lemaitre approached it as a, a cosmologist, as a physical cosmologist. Robertson um, in 1930 to 1933, was uh, a person who pulled it all together and turned it into a kind of a coherent theory. In particular, what I will add to this, there's a very, very fine review article, H.P. Robertson, uh, which is in Reviews of Modern Physics, 1933. And the basic features, the geometrical features of the model, or standard model today, were already found in 1933. They can be found in this review article by H.P. Robertson. What has happened since then is a great deal more understanding of the thermodynamics, of the possible physics, and of the observations. But the basic geometrical structure and the basic field equation are already known by 1933. And then Walker, 1935 to 1944. 
Walker from 1935 to 1944 did some important work together with Robertson on the geometry of these models. And given the fact that nowadays there's a great tendency to look at alternative physics and to look at cosmology from sort of a viewpoint of quite a lot of alternative physics, the work of Robertson Walker is important because what Friedman and Lemaitre did was dependent on the field equations, but what Robertson and Walker did was not. It was independent of the field equations. So their work is very relevant to today's cosmology. So the first parts of these talks are going to be on the standard model, the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson. I guess I better write that down. Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, and Walker. And so you will find all these names associated with these standard models. So I've got four lectures plus the evening one. The evening one will be the critical review. The later parts of the sessions, if we have time, will be looking at the alternative models. But the main part is my brief is to look at the basic features of the standard model of cosmology. Okay, now, it has a large number of features which I'm going to go through in these lectures. And the first points about it, what underlies cosmology? What underlies cosmology is gravity. Now, because what underlies cosmology is gravity, what we need to use is general relativity because that is the classical theory of gravity. Now, why is gravity the force that underlies cosmology? Because it is the dominant long-range force in the universe, and it dominates the solar system, it dominates our galaxy, it dominates everything on larger scales. The question you should ask yourselves at this point is to say, wait a minute, gravity is not the only large-scale force. Why is not electromagnetism the dominant force. Because, as you should recall from your fundamental physics, electromagnetism, you've been told, is a much, much stronger force than gravity. If electromagnetism is much stronger than gravity, why is gravity the dominant force and not electromagnetism? Well, the answer is, as far as we can tell, the total number of positive charges in the universe, the, um, the positive charges, is the same as the negatives. And this is a crucial feature of the universe. If this was not true, cosmology would not be dominated by gravity. It would be dominated by electromagnetism. But this, this equality of positive and negative charges has to be true to very high accuracy because the electromagnetic force is so much stronger than the gravitational force. There have been people who have looked at possibilities of cosmology in which this was not true, in which there was this very, very small preponderance of either positive or negative charges. And those models are not believed. But you should keep asking yourself, why do we believe that in the scale of the solar system, the scale of the galaxy, and bigger scales, that there is the same number of positive and negative charges? Because if it wasn't true, then electromagnetism will dominate. Okay, well, having mentioned that possibility, I'm going to assume that equality. And because of that, we only have, we have gravity as the dominant force in the universe, and therefore we have general relativity as the theory that is relevant. Okay. Now, what that means is that we will be dealing with space-time. So we will have four coordinates, x, a, where a is 0, 1, 2, 3. It is four-dimensional. Now, as you will know, in present-day physics, there's a great deal of stuff going on about 10 dimensions, 20 dimensions, 120 dimensions. <laughs> the only space-time we have evidence for is four-dimensional. Okay? It doesn't matter what you hear from anybody else in string theory or anything else. There is no proof that any of those other things exist. What we know exists is four-dimensional. <laughs> and that's what we will be dealing with here. Okay. So, we have space-time with its four coordinates. It's four-dimensional. We have a metric tensor 
which depends on position in space-time. In special relativity, it's independent. In general relativity, it's dependent on position in space-time. Now, I've been told that you have all done courses in general relativity. What we get from the metric tensor is the interval. So I'm doing a very quick uh, summary. What happens there is if you go along a path in space-time from a point xA to a point xA plus dxA, so you go along a displacement dxA, the interval assigned ds squared is given by the metric tensor and is given by that formula. And it's this interval which is important. If it is less than naught, then this corresponds to a clock measurement the clock measurement, and the proper time detour is the square root of minus ds squared. If this is greater than naught, it corresponds to a spatial measurement, and the distance, d, um, d capital D, is square root plus ds squared, and if this is equal to naught, it is motion at the speed of light, and represents motion of a, of a particle moving out of the speed of light, for instance, light itself. And so the set, when you have ds squared as zero, it defines the future light cone and the past light cone at each point in the space-time. So in the space-time, you've got the future light cone and the past light cone, Time-like vectors, motion at the speed of light, are in the interior, and so matter motions have ds squared less than naught, which corresponds to the speeds less than the, the speed of light, which we will take to be 1. So, you've got a space-time with coordinates. You've got a metric tensor. What does the metric tensor tell you? It tells you clock measurements. If it is less than naught along a displacement, it tells you spatial distance if it's bigger than naught, and it tells you that you're moving at the speed of light if it is equal to naught. Okay, now, from that, we determine the connection of the space-time, which determines the covariant derivative. And I'm just reminding you, I can't do all the... Sum the, the details of this in this very brief introduction. But what this does for you in particular, it tells you what are geodesics. And a geodesic is a curve which is parallel along itself. And a geodesic is extremely important because a geodesic means motion under gravity plus inertia alone. Motion under gravity and inertia alone. If you're a geodesic, you are moving under gravity and inertia alone. For instance, the Earth moves around the Sun on a geodesic. The Moon moves around the Earth on a geodesic. The galaxy moves on a geodesic in the cosmos. And so any object which is moving under gravity and inertia alone will be moving on a geodesic, which is a curve which is parallel along itself. If the tangent vector is dxA by dv, then it satisfies the equation xA semicolon bxB, where that's the covariant derivative is equal to naught. And that's a way of saying that the curve is parallel along itself. And in particular, light rays are geodesics, because light moves under only gravity and inertia. So light rays are geodesics, and the light cone represents the motion of light particles by which we see in the future and from which we can signal to the future. So I'm just saying all of this is just a brief summary. We're working with general relativity, so all of this is true. Now, the next thing we need is a stress tensor of matter and radiation and any fields which are present. And this tells you the total energy and momentum of all particles present. And from this, we solve the Einstein field equations. The Ricci tensor minus a half the Ricci scalar times the metric is equal to the gravitational constant times TAB. 
And these equations, the Einstein field equations, are what determine the metric tensor of the space-time. Um, and you can, if you want to, add in a cosmological constant. And the cosmological constant lambda has